Would you welcome to this house, Ross Johnson. Hey, just stay standing, stay standing for a quick sec, quick sec. Uh, Pastor Darren didn't know this. I had like a whole thing I was gonna go into the election just to start, so he stole every line of mine, but it's okay. But let me, let me say something real quick. Let me, just, let me just add on to that while we're already in that, in that vein, so to speak. You know, I've had the privilege over the last couple of years of traveling America, different nations, and, you know, God's given me influence on social media, and, you know, half a million people follow me on different platforms. Hear what I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not trying to just elevate myself. Hear me for a sec. The reason why I'm sharing all that is because one of the main things that I hear on social media all across the nation when we talk about politics and the presidential election is, well, Ross, you're a Christian white nationalist. <laughs> Ross, you're racist. I'm like, bro, I grew up in an area where I was the only white kid. Come on now. Ross, you're a bigot. I'm like, oh my gosh, these people are crazy. But let me, let me break something down real quick because I wanna do something. Let's, let me break this down for a sec. Jesus prayed a prayer. He said, Father, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this means that one of God's greatest desires is what? For his kingdom, his atmosphere, his ways to be a reality on this side of eternity. Are you with me? Now we also see in the scripture where Paul said, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So if a nation pursues, stands, and is built on freedom, then it's probably a nation in whom the Lord is pleased in. Are you with me? Now, here, here's, what's, here's what's really funny. Here's what's really funny. You know, last night I was uh, praying for people at the, at the altar after the service, and this lady came up to me. She might even be here today. I'm not sure. But she came up to me, and she, she came uh, from India to America, and She's talking to me and she's like, hey, can you pray for me? I'm like, absolutely. And we start, ch ch you know, chatting a little bit. I'm just like, hey, tell me a little bit more about your life. And she goes, you know, I came to America from India and brought my family here because I thought this was a Christian nation. I thought this was a land where Jesus was truly king and I could raise my family and my kids here. And, you know, in that moment, it, it, it hit me for a second. This is way beyond left, right. This is way beyond conservative and liberal. This is way beyond my preference. This is way beyond my skin color. This is way beyond what stream I'm in in the church. I mean, this is way beyond what we can even ask, think, or imagine. It's way beyond ourselves. And here's why we fight for America. Because America, is it perfect? No, but newsflash, no nation is perfect. Is America perfect? No, but in this land, we have always fought for other nations and other people. And so I believe, stay with me, stay with me. I believe that when Trump got shot, y'all remember that? Man, the media just tucked that away like nothing happened. He, he, he shouldn't be here today. He shouldn't be here today. When he got shot, I find it so interesting and significant that duty 78, Okay, if I get shot, I'm 30, I'm, going, I'm crawling on the floor out that place. <laughs> Give me like a good steak, put, get somebody lay some hands on me, grandmas bring the anointing oil, like I don't want to do anything else. What does he do? He stands up and he says, fight, fight, fight. Now I don't want to hyper-spiritualize everything, but I will say this, could it have been a prophetic moment where one man was declaring with all the eyes of the world on America that we are in a season, not just as the church, but as Americans, where we are supposed to fight for this land like we never have before. So here's what I wanna do, and then you're gonna sit down. You're like, dang, this guy doesn't let me sit down. Can we just give one of the loudest, rowdiest celebrations for what God did on Tuesday here in America, saying we stand for righteousness, we stand for the kingdom of heaven, we stand for you, King Jesus. We say thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Holy Spirit.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The hand of God is on our land. The hand of God is on our land. You can take a seat. You can take a seat. You can take a seat. Whew. Wow. Oh. Y'all are crazy. Yeah, I like crazy because God's crazy. Amen. You guys ready this morning? How many were here, just so I have an idea, how many were here for these past few days for the conference? Just lift your hand real quick. Yeah, that's called a good church when the entire church is at the conference. That's a great church. Well, hey, I wanna just share my story. I know all of you guys already heard it, but I know there's people here that haven't and I just wanna connect personally with you before we dive into anything else. And I wanna just share my story because the Bible says we what? We overcome by the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony. Don't forget that last part. People don't like that last part. <laughs> and not loving our life unto death. So for me, you know, my life story really started on day one. You're like, what does that mean? We all start on day one. I know. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is on day one, you know, I was born by artificial insemination. I grew up in a lesbian household with two moms. I had never been to church my whole life. I had never met a pastor, Darren. You know, I was never in an atmosphere like you guys are in this morning. I was never in a building like this. And I remember from about zero to 15 years old, you know, nothing really traumatic happened other than the fact that when I started getting older, I was like, people have moms and dads, but I have two moms. Hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, 15, 16 years old comes and a friend invites me to church and I had never been to church my entire life. And so, you know, I'm sitting all the way in the back row and this is my line. I love to say this. I go, God will get you in the back row. Be ready this morning. He'll get you. <laughs> so I'm sitting all the way in the back row and you know, the pastor is preaching. I can't tell you a single word he said till this day. I have no clue what he preached on, no clue. But here's what I do remember, that for the first time in my life, something was happening on the inside of me. I started to feel destiny. I started to feel hope. I, I started to feel like, man, maybe, just maybe, there's something more than what I've experienced in my life so far. And so I go home that night, and I'm in my room, and keep in mind, I never had a conversation with God, okay? I don't know how to dialogue with God. <laughs> I don't know how to commune with him. I don't even know what that means. But in my room, as I look back on this 12, 13 years ago, here's what I believe the Lord was doing in my heart. Here's what my heart was saying. God, please don't let me be a good person who reads a good book, goes to a good church, and lives a good life. No. God, I want to know your power. I wanna know your presence. I don't want just a head knowledge of you, God. I want a heart experience and a heart revelation. I want this thing to be so real to me that it's not just something I picked up at a church service. It's not just something I picked up from another man or another woman. No, no, God, you have to do something in me. Don't just do it for the preacher, God. Don't just do it for the worship leader. Don't just do it for the person on stage. Don't just do it for the grandma who's been praying for 40 years. God, you gotta do it for me. Why, why? Because my life isn't working. I have everything the world's told me to get, but I'm laying my head on the pillow at night and my soul is empty. My soul is broken. And so I remember the next week I go to church. And this is kind of funny. I always forget to mention this, but I'll mention it this morning because you guys are a laughing bunch. <laughs> oh gosh, shouldn't have said that word laugh. Hopefully I could preach for the rest of this service. <laughs> the following week, I, my friend who invited me to church I told her, I said, it was her and her grandma. I said, hey, I would love to go to the high school service because I want to meet people my age. You know what she tells me? I ain't going. I'm like, wait, what? I'm not a believer here and I want to go to church and you're telling me you don't want to go with me. That's crazy. So what do I do? I go to this high school service. There was about 300 students. That's a pretty big high school ministry. I walk in there. I don't know a single person, but I had faith. I didn't know anything, I didn't know anybody, I didn't even know what I was getting myself into, but here's what was happening in, this, in my soul, is I had faith. What's faith? God, I believe you are who you say you are and you can do what you say you will do, now do it in me. And so I walk into this high school service, and once again, guess where I'm sitting? In the back row, and I'm in that back row, and the preacher says, you gotta give your life to Jesus. I'm like, what does that mean? But what do I do? I lift my hand. And I prayed the prayer and I said, Jesus, I surrender my life. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you shed your blood. I believe you broke your body. I believe you rose from the dead. Here's my life, God. And in that moment, 
without a single goosebump, praise God for the goosebumps. Without a single feeling, praise God for the feelings. But with a heart and a spirit of faith, I received God. I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior at 15 years old. A few years after that, a few years after that, I grew up in Los Angeles, probably a good, a good part of the story you should know. I grew up in Los Angeles. I graduate high school. I go to college in San Diego because I'm pursuing baseball. I love sports growing up, sports center. I watched that thing like eight hours a day. I was addicted to sports. And I remember I get to college and I was studying business and I'm in college for those four years. And once again, nothing traumatic happened, which I'm so grateful for. But I graduated college in 2016 and I figured out how to pay this thing called rent. Anybody ever heard of it? <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I gotta pay rent. So I was so broke at the time that I literally slept. I, I, so let me backtrack a little bit. I graduate college and like, I, gotta, I gotta figure out how to pay rent. My friend comes up to me and he says, hey, do you wanna open a gym with me? I'm like, dude, I have no business experience. I mean, I like sports, sure, why not, I'll do it. So we open a gym, <laughs> I'm like, okay. We opened a gym, but I was so broke at the time that the person I opened the gym with, I literally slept on his floor next to his bed every night for a couple years. And in that moment, when I graduated college, I made the worst decision of my life. And I said, God, I don't have the money I want. I don't have the car I want. I don't have the house I want, the girlfriend I want. Notice the word I a lot in there. And I played the blame game with God. And as soon as we play the blame game with God, what happens in our hearts is we turn to bitterness. And as soon as we turn to bitterness, then we walk out of intimacy, nearness, closeness with God. And so for these next three and a half years of my life, I tried to, I, I tried to build the business. I, did make, I ended up making some sort of money. I ended up you know, kind of having some sort of influence and all these different things. But I found myself back at step one where I would lay my head on the pillow at night and I was broken and empty. And so I remember in 2020, y'all remember 2020? Like, Ross, please do not go there. Oh, we about to go there. In 2020, it felt like people were gonna die over an Instagram story. Facebook used to be posting your dog and cat. Now it's like civil war. And so I remember on social media, I'm looking at this and I wasn't following Jesus at the time. I was still, I, I didn't want anything to do with God. And I remember as I'm, in this moment, the Holy Spirit speaks to me. <laughs> and you know what he tells me? He says, Ross, if you don't stand now, you never will. Now listen, I love the father heart of God. I love Abba. I love it all. But this was not a daddy God type of moment. This was a stern father looking at his son saying, you have a decision to make today that will impact you not just for today, not just this week, not just this month, but for the rest of your life. And so in 2020, I'm on my knees, I'm weeping, I'm crying. Many of us probably had encounters in that year. And I'm on my knees and I pray the most dangerous prayer that any person could pray on the face of the planet. God, here I am, send me, use my life. Whew, buckle up. And I pray this prayer and a few months later, I walk into a tent revival in Orange County, California. And in this tent revival, there's this lady preaching. And she says, I was asking the Lord, what is, it gonna, what, are, what is it gonna take to see revival in California, revival in America? She said, the Lord spoke to her. It's gonna be like Mary in the alabaster jar. Y'all remember that story in the scripture? Mary brings this alabaster jar. She pours it out on Jesus' feet. And one of the disciples say, why are you doing that? It's so expensive. You could have used it for all these other great things. And she said, the Lord spoke to me about that story on revival. And she brings this guy up on the stage who was leading worship that night. His name is Joel. She says, Joel, you have a sound of worship of revival in you that needs to be released across California. And the Lord told me to give you my brand new Jeep car. Here are my keys to my car. That's different. Did you hear that? That's different. I'll never forget being in this meeting. And after she did that, people are throwing watches, jewelry, diamond earrings, wallets, phones, coat jackets, shoes, everything you can imagine all on the altar saying, we will give anything for revival in America. And in that moment, God marked my heart again. He marked my heart afresh for revival. He interrupted my life. See, if we wanna disrupt the plans of the enemy, you have to let God disrupt your life. Come on. So God disrupts me that night. He marks me for revival again. And I don't, once again, I don't have the answers. I don't know what to do, but I know this much, I'm burning. <laughs> and I say, God, you gotta give me people. I can't do this alone. 
And sure enough, that night, that guy who gets the Jeep, his, like I said, his name is Joel. Him and I connect. We start talking. We start figuring out. We both have this desire for revival. And so we said, we don't know what to do, but we know this much. We should probably do what the Bible says. It's a great idea. <laughs> if you don't know what to do, do this thing. <laughs> so what do we do? We show up at Huntington Beach in August of 2021. Y'all know Huntington Beach? One of the most famous beaches in California. Beautiful. Don't go there because you'll never come back here. Okay, amen, amen. Tacos are crazy out here in California. They're out there crazy in California. You ain't never had tacos like California. Okay, okay. I might be a little hungry. Amen. <laughs> Darren, give me tacos after the service ASAP. So, gosh, I love you guys already. I feel like I'm just with family this morning. Like I can, we can just laugh. We can just be who we are. <laughs> So we go to Huntington Beach, August 2021, no social media, never preached a day in my life. And we thought 50 people would show up and all of a sudden 400 people show up. We're like, what the heck is going on here? I'm not going up to people shaking their hands because I'm really trying to figure out if they're like real people or angels, you know what I mean? I'm like, are you, like, I'm like, like, are you real? Like, who, how'd, you, how'd you get here? <laughs> people are coming up to me, Ross, how long you been a pastor? I'm like, 30 minutes. <laughs> Ross. <laughs> Ross, what church do you go to? I'm like, bro, I started going back to church six months ago. But we knew this. We knew that God had begun something. So we named it California Will Be Saved. And for the last three and a half years, we hit 33 cities across California. Every major city you could think of, San Francisco, Sacramento, Orange County, Fresno, San Diego, Los Angeles. Team, I'm not sure if we have it. If, if we don't, it's okay. I'll just cry later. But if we have those pictures I showed on Thursday night, if you could pop it up. If we don't have it, not a big deal. Don't stress about it. But last year, something significant happened. If you guys get the picture, just throw it up there, but no worries. No, no, seriously. I'm being, no, no. <laughs> yes, come on, team. Come on. <laughs> yes. So last year in 2023, we did two events in LA and I was talking with Joel and uh, we were like, man, I really feel like we got to do a third event in LA. I'm like, bro, if we're going to do a third event in the same city, it's go big or go home. And so this random thought popped in my head, what I thought was random. And I looked at him and said, what if we shut down Hollywood Boulevard? <laughs> See, while I was laughing, God wasn't. I get a call the next weekend from a city official and he says, hey, I heard you're trying to shut down Hollywood Boulevard. I have a permit for you. Can we go back? Can we go back real quick? Can we go back real quick to the Hollywood picture? So this is what happens. 2,000 people show up. 118 documented salvations. 38 baptisms. Guys, we're baptizing people in horse troughs on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Come on. Thank you, God. We go to the next picture. The following month, we show up at Huntington Beach for our three-year anniversary, and close to 3,000 people show up there on the beach. Just keep that up for a sec, just for a quick sec. Why do I show you these pictures? Friend, church, revival is not coming. It's not coming. It's already here in our land, guys. It's already here in our families. It's already here in our cities. It's already here in our churches. It's already here in America. It's already in you this morning, friend. <laughs> Revival. <laughs> when the pastor says that he finally can breathe, he's like, I brought a good preacher out this morning. Okay. I did good. I did good. <laughs> I talk like that. I honor Pastor Darren. We have a great friendship. We have a great relationship. One of the best leaders in the Pacific Northwest is right here in this house. See, my generation, we take for granted leaders like that. Don't take leaders like him and his family and this team and this church for granted. 
I travel all across America and I love every church I go to, but not every church is created equal, friend. Not every, and that's not me ripping the church because the church is the bride of Jesus and you better be careful how you talk about someone's bride. You might get punched. If I go up to Pastor Darren's wife or to Pastor Darren and start talking about his wife in a negative way, you think he's gonna be like, oh, bless you, brother. Yeah, you're so sweet. Yeah, I'll make sure I tell her when we go home tonight. No. <laughs> you can take the picture down, thank you. This year in 2024, we went back to Hollywood Boulevard and 2,500 people showed up. Wow. See, what's interesting is three years ago, we showed up at Huntington Beach with two, three, maybe 400 people. And three years later, we showed up with two to 3,000. See, we're living in a season where God is not looking for the best but he's looking for the yes. You might not have it all figured out. You might not come from the best family. You might not come from the best city. You might not have the most money in the bank account, but if you have a yes, God can take you places in three years that usually take 30. See, I heard a preacher say it like this. We obviously don't know when Jesus comes back, please. Don't cut this and post it on social media in only 10 second bits because my ministry will be canceled. <laughs> we do not know when Jesus is coming back. Did everybody hear me? But let's say it's 100 years from now. Let's just hypothetically say that. Well, if we go back 100 years from 2024, 1924, that means we'd be 200 years away. Are you following me? But now that we're in 2024 and there's only 100 years to go, if that happens to be the year, what that means is, is the return of Jesus is more near, so God has a timeline to get things done by. There's things that he wants to do before he sends his son back, aka he wishes that nobody would perish. So this means that if somebody has a yes in their heart and purity in their walk with God, God will give them more than he did in past generations because the timeline's getting shorter. Are you with me? So why are we pressing in for God? Why are we pressing in at Eden Church? Why are we pressing in in Pacific Northwest in America? Because we don't know the time, the hour, or the day, but we do know this much. God, you want revival more than us. God, you want revival more than our pastors. You want revival more than your leaders. And we're not begging God to do something he's never done before. <laughs> in the history of America for the 250 years that we've been on the face of this planet, at every century and almost every day, decade, there's been a move of God in our land. Look at that ground underneath your feet for a sec. That ground underneath your feet is a land of revival. There is a DNA of revival in America. And friend, let me tell you something, it's beginning to surface once again. It's beginning to well up in the hearts of the church. It's beginning to well up in sons and daughters of God. The spirit of God is ready to move. Are you ready? Gosh, I could preach forever in this anointing. Let me finish my story and then I probably, you're like, does this guy get into the Bible? We will, give me two minutes, give me two minutes. I love the word of God, we got a lot of it this morning. You're like a lot of it, you're already halfway through, you think. <laughs> <clears throat> I love you, Pastor Greg, you're awesome. You're incredible. So 2024, Hollywood, Huntington Beach, all these things happen. Did you know that a few weekends ago, some of y'all were there because I talked to you, there was a gathering on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., 350,000 Christians showed up. <laughs> to fast, to pray, to worship, to call on God. Let me say it like this before I get into the message. <laughs> From 1620 to 2020, 400 years. P.S. God loves that number four, by the way. For those 400 years, we've seen the Mayflower Compact, we've seen the First Great Awakening, we've seen the, Civil, we've seen the Revolutionary War, Second Great Awakening, Civil War, we've seen Azusa Street, we've seen Amy Simple McPherson, we've seen the Jesus People Movement, we've seen Toronto, we've seen Brownsville, we've seen all these moves of God. But you wanna know what my heart is? This is my heart, God, in my generation, we haven't seen it. Many of you in this room, you've been in the services where the power of God hits you and you're on the floor for five hours. There's no worship team singing, but the presence of God is increasing. My generation, we haven't been in that yet. 
And this has been my prayer. God, I honor the saints of the past. I share their stories. I tell their stories. I pray their stories. I research their stories. But God, I want to see it with my own eyes. I want to hear it with my own ears, God. I want to see it flow with my own hands. I want a story of my own in my generation. And I'm willing, I'm willing, and I'm asking you this morning, are you willing to lay your life on the altar to see revival in America? To say, God, no matter what it costs, no matter what I got to go through, no matter what pain I felt in my life, who's going to ascend higher? Yeah, you're right. Something happened to you when you were five years old that shouldn't have happened to you. We're, we, we'll pray for you. But you can't stay in that forever. Yeah, you're right. That person did you wrong in that business deal and they ripped you off hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. But you can't stay in that forever. Yeah, you're right. Your dad walked out on you or your mom doesn't care about you. You're right. There's a father in heaven who wants to heal you. See, we got we to gotta let this thing called revival not become just a cute Christian charismatic term. It's got to be how I operate, how I breathe, how I think, how I live, how I talk, how I speak, how my friendships are, how my marriage is, how I treat my children, how I honor the church, how I sow my finances. You'll be okay, I said finances. See, revival is three things. It's when the church of Jesus Christ returns back to first love for him above everything else. Number two, it's when the lost who don't know Jesus are saved or revived back to life by becoming born again. And number three, it's the reformation of society. If we say we have revival in the building, but nothing happens outside the building, we just had a cute Christian powwow. See, what... What revival is, is when God does something in us, it then begins to flow out of us. When God does something for me, for you, it's not just for me and for you, it's for the world around you. And so what I wanna do this morning is last night, I thought I had a message prepared. The Lord's like, oh, I got something for you. I'm like, the day before God, come on. And the Lord started taking me through different people, different stories and situations all throughout scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. And he showed me, he highlighted five specific people who shook their nation. Because I think it's easy when we talk about revival and we get in church services and we get in conferences, which I love it all, I do it full time. It's easy to see the person with the mic, but don't forget this mic is 1% of my life. This mic is 1% of Pastor Darren's life. 99% is what happens off the mic. Whole nother message for a whole nother time. The point is this, it can be easy to see people on the stages, on the mic, singing, prophesying, preaching, five-fold ministry and say, well, I'm not like that. I don't have that gift. God, they, that dude Ross, man, like he, he can communicate on a stage. I can't even communicate to my mom. <laughs> he speaks in front of thousands of people. I can't even speak to the grocery store person without having my head down. Like, but I felt the Lord highlight five people who people will look at in scripture and we forget that these were just ordinary people. They were just people who didn't have it all figured out. <laughs> Many of them should have never been called by God, <laughs> by his own standards. But because of his grace and his faith and his love and because he doesn't see outward appearance, but he sees the inward heart of a human, he said, I wanna use that person to shake a nation. I wanna use that person to bring revival in their day, in their generation. You guys, with, you guys with me? So let's do this. Go with me to Judges chapter six. Judges chapter six. I love the book of Judges. It's so amazing. Judges chapter six. I'm gonna read a few verses of a few different stories. <clears throat> Praise God. Judges chapter six, go with me to verse number 11. Now, before we read it, let's give me, let me give you some quick context. The people of God disobeyed God like normal. <laughs> and because they disobeyed him, God sent the Midianites to conquer them and control them. But here's the deal about this, these people group, the Midianites. They were so harsh and cruel to the Israelites, they would take their crops, they would take their livestock. It says that the Israelites were literally in starvation, okay? This is like not a bad day. This is like as worse as it gets. You with me? And I find it interesting, if you go to verse number 11, this is what it says. The angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree, which belonged to Joash. 
Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him, watch this, listen to this, and said, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestor told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. Verse 15, but Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe and I am the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. See, what happens after this moment is Gideon goes up against the Midianites who are literally numbered in the hundreds of thousands. And he has an army of about 10, 20,000 range and God tells him, that's too big. Now listen, if there's an army of 100,000 and I only have 10,000 and God tells me you're too big, I'm gonna be like, "Uh, do you not see their army? Do you not see how many are on their side? But the thing that's interesting is God presses even further. He says, I'm gonna number it down to 300. (laughs) Those are not good odds, by the way. And as soon as the army of Gideon and his 300 attacked the Midianites, because they followed the voice of the Lord, it says that the enemy began to fight against itself and destroyed itself. Did you know that when you follow the voice of God, you don't always have to fight the enemy. Sometimes they'll fight themselves. Did you know that if you obey the word of God, the voice of God, the prophetic word on your life, you honor the church, you do the things that the Lord tells you to do, that sometimes that enemy in front of you will one day disappear without you even having to lift a finger. Come on. But here's point number one this morning when I read Gideon's story. Gideon came from a lowly family, the weakest tribe of them all. And I felt like what the Lord was saying in this hour is one of these five groups of people that God's really looking for to use is those who come from families that nobody else has chosen. See, right now, it's easy to look at me and say, Ross, man, you're gifted, man, you're anointed. But four years ago, nobody knew my name. Four years ago, I never preached on a stage. What's the point here? I came, literally, I'd never had a dad my entire life. I'd never been to church my entire life. But because God saw a yes in my heart, he said, I'm gonna use that one for revival. See, I am living proof of Gideon. I come from a family, why would anybody ever want me? Why would God ever wanna use me? I don't have experience. I don't have any crazy gifting. I don't have any, there's nothing special about me. I grew up in a small city outside of Los Angeles and nobody knows but God saw my heart and he said, Ross, I would much rather have a heart like yours than a mind like the world. I would much rather trust somebody who might come from a low, weak, not known family situation because I know that when I trust them with my presence and my glory, they'll give it back to me. Friend, if you are a part of a family that you feel like there's no history There's nothing that goes your way. There's nothing on your side. Well, look where you're at this morning. If you feel like, yeah, no one knows my last name. (laughs) Nobody's ever gonna know me. I might not ever be on a stage and you might not be. That's not the point of this. The point I'm saying is this. It doesn't matter your family background or context. If you walk in purity and truly pursue God, what if he wants to raise you up to lead an army to destroy the enemy of your generation? Number two, flip the page back one, Judges chapter four. Everybody loves talking about Deborah and Esther and we're gonna talk about one of them later, but many, many people forget about this one woman. Let me me give you some, (laughs) this is not gonna be a cute Christian story, so buckle up. Judges chapter four. (laughs) Let me give the context before I read. Israel's going to battle once again. This prophet by the the name of Deborah, she begins to prophesy that Israel is gonna win 
and the person in charge at the time comes to her and says, hey, will you come to me? Will you come to this battle with me? Because I just, honestly, that person didn't have enough faith to win, so they wanted to bring the prophet. Always a good idea, actually. If the prophet's in the room, bring him with you. Amen. <laughs> so they go to battle, but there's a few keys here that the Bible talks about, the scripture says, that I think a lot of people forget, even sometimes I forget or I miss. And what it says is if you go with me to verse number 17, Sorry, verse 11, verse 11. Right before they're about to go to battle, this is what it says. Now, Heber the Kenite, a descendant of Moses' brother-in-law, had moved away from the other members of his tribe. And it says this, when Sisera, I'm gonna give you the context in a sec, just stay with me. When Sisera was told that Barak's son, gosh, these names are incredible, had called for his iron chariots and all of his warriors, they marched. Deborah the prophet said to Barak, Barak, get ready. This is the day the Lord will give you victory over Sisera, for the Lord is marching ahead of you. <laughs> then it says in verse 16, he chased the chariots of the enemy of the army all the way, all the way to where they had come, killing all of Sisera's warriors, and not a single one was left alive. Meanwhile, Sisera ran to the tent of Jael, the wife, here, catch in, key in the wife of Heber the Kenite, because Heber's family was on friendly terms with the enemy, with the king's enemy. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, come into my tent, sir, come in, don't be afraid. So he went into her tent and she covered him with the blanket. Please give me some water, he said, I'm thirsty. So she gave him some milk from a leather bag and covered him again. He said this, stand at the door of the tent. If anybody comes and asks you if there is anyone here, say no, pause. Context, Israel goes to battle. When they go to battle, they literally destroy every single one of the enemy soldiers except one, his name is Sisera, the commander of the army. Now, when Sisera is fleeing from this battle because every single one of his troops is being destroyed, he ends up at this tent of a woman named Jael. Jael's family was supposed to live where the Israelites were, but they had moved away to another land and this land they moved to was the enemy's land. Are you tracking? So when Sisera leaves the battle, He's like, I'm going back to my land. I'll be safe there. He finds the tent of Jael. He goes, oh, perfect. This family, they live in our land. We're on friendly terms. We're good to go. She literally puts a blanket on him. She gives him some milk like a baby. <laughs> I think God has a sense of humor. This is a war general. And he asked for water. And she's like, let me give you some baby. Let me give you some milk, little baby. Just my thoughts. But... Go with me to verse 21. But when Sisera fell asleep from exhaustion, Jael quietly crept up to him with a hammer and tent peg in her hand. Then she drove the tent peg through his temple and into the ground, so he died. When Barak came looking for Sisera, Jael went to meet him. She said, come and I will show you the man you are looking for. So he followed her into the tent and found Sisera lying there dead with a tent peg through his temple. So on that day, Israel saw God defeat the Canaanite king, their enemy. And from that time on, Israel became stronger and stronger against the king until they finally destroyed him. Uh, see, there's women in here. You've never fit into the cute Christian box and you never will. Oh, you got your lashes on? You look good, girl. <laughs> yeah. You got your Gucci belt on? You look good, girl. You got your eyeliner, it's looking good, hallelujah, amen. Praise God for women. <laughs> but you were meant to have an edge to you. You were meant to be a little bit rowdy. You were meant to be a holy rebel. <laughs> you were meant to be one who like JL, maybe in a past season of your life, you used to be on friendly terms with the enemy. And at a moment in the nation that the enemy was being defeated, doesn't it sound like today? When the enemy tries to come back into your tent and speak to you and talk to you because he thinks you're on his side, you take that tent peg and that hammer and you deliver that final blow to him. 
and you say, enemy, in the past season of my life, I used to be friends with you. I used to look out for you. I used to agree with you. But now the God of Israel is in my camp. My allegiance is no longer to the kingdom of darkness. My allegiance is to King Jesus. And I'm going to take this weapon in my hand and I'm going to deliver that final blow to you. The second group of people God's looking for in this season when it comes to women is those who, like I said, you never fit the box. You might feel a little weird. You might feel like, man, I don't know why. Just like, I, I love all the feminine stuff. Amen. Stay feminine, please. <sighs> please, please. Lord, we just pray for feminine women in America. Make, make feminine women great again. Amen. <laughs> I live in California, y'all. I see what y'all see too. I get it. I get it. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> God is looking for the women who have a weapon in their hand. Who, yeah, you used to call allegiance to that other king, the enemy. But now in the season of life you're in, you're submitted to King Jesus. And could it be in this season, in this hour, while the enemy is retreating, you could be the one that delivers the final blow. You could be the one who turns a generation back to the Lord. You could be a one who is not just watching the battle, you're a part of the battle. Amen? <clears throat> Go with me to 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16. Verse one, you guys okay if I read like this? You guys like reading scripture? Yes. Okay, I'm in, I'm in the right place this morning, amen, amen. Verse 16, or sorry, verse one of 1 Samuel 16. Now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. For Saul, I have rejected him as king of Israel, so fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. Samuel asked, how can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Go to verse five. Yes, Samuel replied, I have come, or sorry, verse four. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. Why? Because Samuel was a prophet. What's wrong, they asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. Verse seven, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Did you hear that? People judge, doesn't it sound like the presidential election? People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Be careful about talking about somebody's heart from the past season of their life. Oh yeah, I feel it, so we're gonna do it. <laughs> People go, there's no way I could vote for that guy. He's not godly. He doesn't love Jesus. I don't like his language. Do you know about those women in his past? You know what I say to those people? Look at your past life. Look at those women you hooked up with. Look how you used to talk. Look how you used to be. See, the Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That at one point, all of us on the face of the planet used to not just be not friends of God, we were his enemies. But when we surrendered our life to Jesus and made him our Lord and got cleansed by his blood and his body, his death and his resurrection, we've become born again. And now we have the spirit of God living in us. Is Trump a born again Christian? I don't know. But I'll tell you this much. He allows and loves to have pastors pray for him. He loves to have the Bible in his hand. He loves to at least reference God in a holy, reverent way. He at least says the name of Jesus. He at least honors our Christian holidays, our days of memorance. 
See, God doesn't just look at outward appearance in the past. He looks at the heart in the future ahead. Why am I preaching about this? This is way more than Trump, guys. What happens in four years from now? What happens in eight years from now? Trump's not our savior. Trump's not our savior. We don't worship Trump. We just recognize an instrument that God is using to help build the church and to give the church an opportunity to usher in the kingdom of heaven back to earth. Trump isn't coming to your school board meeting, friend. He's not coming to your local coffee shop. He's not coming to your principal's office, but he'll give you the opportunity for you to do so. He'll fight for your freedom to take a stand for your faith. He'll allow you to stand outside of an abortion clinic and pray. Are we following? Verse eight. Then Jesse told his son to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. And Jesse kept doing this for all seven of his sons. Verse 11, Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but, oh, I love when the Bible says but, because it means something good's coming. And it means we should really pay attention. He's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. The third group of people that I believe God's choosing in this season is those who aren't the first choice. You're not the second choice. You're not the third choice. You're not even the seventh choice. We're not even the seventh choice. (laughs) But I find it interesting about David's life that he was just tending to the sheep and the goats. God is choosing people who are consistently handling the ordinary with purity. God is looking for the people who they're just taking care of their families. They're just taking care of the church. They're just serving on the prayer altar team. They're just serving on the worship team. They're just sowing in their finances to the kingdom of God. They're just doing the lowly, you know, the Christian things you're supposed to do. But in one moment, God sends a prophet and says, anoint that one for the work of the ministry. Anoint that one to lead the nation. Anoint that one to destroy every enemy in the land. See, if you feel like you're just living a mundane, ordinary life, you know what I say to you? Yes and amen. You know what I say to you? Keep going. You know what I say to you? Keep being consistent. You know what I say to you? Keep treating people well. You know what I say to you? Keep honoring your pastor. You know what I say to you? Keep opening your wallet and sowing into the kingdom of God. You know what I say to you? Keep singing with a pure heart on this stage. You know what I say to you? Keep drumming with every ounce of energy you have, believing for breakthrough in this city, in this region. Because you never know when God is sending somebody to anoint you to be the next leader of your region, of your family, of a generation, of a nation. Could it be, oh, I don't know. Oh yeah, here it is. Thank you, Lord. God loves to use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. See, the world may look at me and you and go, that person can't do nothing. Until the anointing of God comes on you, everything changes. Because that anointing breaks every single yoke. Because that spirit in us is greater than every spirit of the world. Because we are the head and not the tail. We are the top, not the bottom. There is more on our side than there is on their side. Our ladder is greater than our former. When the enemy attacks one way, guess what? He has to flee seven. Because the greatest, most powerful entity on the face of the planet is not a presidential candidate or a political party. It's not the World Economic Forum or the United Nations. It's not the wealthiest on Forbes list. It's not Bill Gates. It's not Jeff Bezos. It's not Mark Zuckerberg. It's not Charles Schwab. It's the Church of Jesus Christ. It's the church of Jesus Christ. 
It's the body of Christ, the family of God, the sons and daughters of God. It's you and it's I. That is the most powerful entity. Number four, go with me to the book of Esther. You guys doing okay, by the way? Okay. We're almost done, kind of, maybe. Context here, context here. Go to Esther chapter four. We'll get there in a sec. <clears throat> the Jews of Judah, the southern kingdom, had been exiled by the Babylonians. The Babylonians were then overtaken by the Persians. So at this time in the book of Esther, the Persians are now ruling in the land. Some of the Jews that had been exiled are back home, but some are still where Persia's at now. Now Esther is a Jew. However, she didn't return home. She hasn't made it back home yet. So she's living in the Persian empire. Now the king at the time, King Xerxes, he has a wife, a queen. Long story short, he basically boots her because he's a horrible man. And he says, he tells his advisors, hey, I want you to search the land, find the most beautiful women. I'm looking for another queen. Well, Esther is a Jew. And at that time and in this season, Jews, I mean, not even that season in time, look at the earth today, all throughout history, the Jews have always been discriminated against. Oh man, there's so many sermons I could preach here. <laughs> Help me, Lord. Esther is a Jew, which means she's looked down upon, she's discriminated against, and they're not known as quote unquote good people in that time. The Persians don't like them. And so what happens when the King Xerxes sends out his advisors to find women, Esther ends up being one of the women that comes into the royal palace. But the king doesn't know she's a Jew. <laughs> so a Jewish woman by the name of Esther, by the way, she was in her young teenage years, who was beautiful in the natural eye. She finds favor, favor of God, and the king makes her the queen, Queen Esther. However, there's this man by the name of Haman who's wicked. Let me just throw this in for a sec. Haman, Hitler, Hamas. Hmm. <laughs> Hezbollah. Hmm. Wonder what that could mean. So, <laughs> just some slight things to throw in there for a quick sec. <laughs> Harris. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Who said that? Point him out. Point him out. <laughs> this is called church, folks. This is called church. <laughs> so Haman hates the Jews and decides to manipulate the king to place a decree in the land where on a certain day you can kill any Jew in the land and you won't be punished for it. It's like the purge in real life, seriously, the purge is biblical. Not to do it, but it happened. And so Esther, who's a Jew, she doesn't even know about this. And her uncle who adopted her because her parents had died, sends her a message and says, Esther, hey, I'm doing 2024 language. Yo, Esther, yeah, pay attention. All of our people are about to be killed on a certain day. You're a Jew in the royal palace, but you're actually not just a Jew, you're the queen, which means you have some sort of favor in the eyes of the king. You need to do something about this. Esther chapter four, read this. <clears throat> Verse seven. Actually, let's just start in verse one. Let's just read it. We're already here. When Mordecai learned about all that, all that had been done, the decree we just talked about, he tore his clothes, put on burlap, burlap and ashes, and went out into the city, crying with a loud and bitter wail. He went as far as the gate of the palace, for no one was allowed to enter the palace gate while wearing clothes of mourning. And the news of the king's decree reached all the provinces there. All the provinces. There was great mourning among the Jews. They fasted, wept, and wailed, and many people lay in burlap and ashes. When Queen Esther's maids came and told her about Mordecai, her uncle, she was deeply distressed. She sent clothing to him to replace the burlap, but he refused it. Then Esther sent for one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed as her attendant. She ordered him to go to Mordecai and find out what was troubling him and why he was in mourning. So the eunuch went out to Mordecai in the square in front of the palace gate. Mordecai told him the whole story, including the exact amount of money 
that Haman had promised to pay for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai gave him a copy of the decree issued and called for the, that called for the death of all the Jews. He asked the attendant to show it to Esther and explain the situation to her. He also asked him to direct her to go to the king to beg for mercy and plead for her people. So he returned to Esther with Mordecai's message. Esther told her servant, go back and relay this message to Mordecai. All the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter. And the king is not called for me to come to him for 30 days. So her attendant gave Esther's message to Mordecai. Let me pause for a sec. I call this the cute Christian response. (laughs) Mordecai basically tells Esther, yo, we're gonna die. Like this is serious, this is serious. We're gonna die, not spiritually die, physically die. And Esther basically says, oh man, uh, well, bless you brother. Let's just pray and hopefully, you know, God intervenes and uh, we'll see what happens here. You know, praise God, hallelujah. Come on, Yahweh, show up. You're the God of Israel. But she does say something significant. See, at that time, if you were to appear before the king without him calling for you, he could kill you on the spot. So not only were the Jewish people's lives on the line, so was Esther's. And then we see right here, verse 13, after Esther gives him the cute Christian response, Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because we're in the palace, you will escape when all of the Jews are killed. Don't think because your kids are in homeschooling, they'll be okay. Don't think just because you voted once, the nation will be saved. Don't think if you just pray once a week, you'll be fine in your spiritual life. Don't think if you read your Bible like 50% of Christians once a week, you'll know the word better than sports stats. Pause. If you can quote me more stats about the Seahawks and the scriptures, there's an issue. If we sow more in a Starbucks than into the spirit, into the kingdom of God, there's an issue. If you know more, more lyrics about Taylor Swift than you do of the words on the screen in this church, there's an issue. I'm coming for you this morning. We're going. What was, what was Mordecai saying? He was basically trying to cut past the cuteness of Esther and say, you got to let this thing get deep. You got to understand the significance of the moment, Esther, because if you don't, not only will we die, but so will you. You're not safe anywhere. This is not a matter of safety, Esther. This is a matter of God is trying to do something. Will you partner with him? Verse 14, this is Mordecai's response. He's still going. That was just line one. He ain't playing. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Everyone loves quoting this last verse. They don't like this next one. Who knows? if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. And everybody ends right there. (laughs) Yeah, Lord, I was born for such a time as this. Woo. Yeah, God. Verse 15. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather together all the Jews and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. Fasting is not just fasting social media, by the way. Uh Uh-oh. My maids and I will do the same And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. We don't like preaching that scripture. The fourth type of people that God is choosing in this hour is those where you have found favor in the secular world. Like Queen Esther, she was a Jew. She was a a daughter of God. She was one of the chosen Israelites. But yet she found herself in a foreign pagan nation, second in command, so to speak. See, if you found favor in a secular space, I can almost guarantee God's not trying to pull you out. He's trying to push you in. Why? 
because we are supposed to be the salt and the light of the earth, the hands and the feet of Jesus, you might be the only Bible somebody reads for their entire life. You might be the only person. See, we live in a day and age where we have so many screens, so many narratives, so many entertainment options that we never have to confront the reality of our souls. We can numb ourselves to eternal death. But God places me and you in certain places, certain businesses, certain houses, certain cities, certain churches, certain regions. Why? Not just because he, he does want to bless you, friend. Absolutely. God is a blesser. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Amen. Oh, but if we're just in this for the blessing, we've missed something. And listen, I'm a big blessing guy. I'm a big prosperity guy. Lord, bless me. Hallelujah. What I'm saying is this, the blessing of God won't satisfy the deepest longings of your heart, but you know what will? Is doing God's work on the earth. You know what, what will? Is doing the great commission. You know what will is when you preach the gospel, when you lay your hands on the sick, when you show up at church on a Sunday, when you spend time with God in the secret place, those things will satisfy the deepest longings of your heart. So if you found favor and influence in the business space, in the education space, whatever space it is, I almost can guarantee God, hear this again, he is not pulling you out, he's pressing you in. He wants to use you like Esther. But here's the other thing about Esther. God is looking for people like Esther who are willing to say, if I must die, I will die. Now, praise God in America, you probably won't naturally die because our land is an amazing land. But what if it's dying to yourself? What if it's dying to your preference? What if it's dying to what's comfortable? What if it's dying to what makes sense to our carnal minds? P.S. An infinite God never fits into our finite intellect minds. <laughs> The point is this, is I believe God's looking for women like Esther who don't just have for such a time as this as a bumper sticker, but instead they have something in their soul and in their heart where they recognize the favor of God on their life and they say, you know what, I'm gonna use my voice because if I don't, somebody else won't. If I don't, if not me, then who? And if not now, then when? And as soon as Esther spoke to the king, he flipped the decree around and the entire generation and nation of Jews were saved. Could it be that on the other side of a yes in your heart and a yes out of your mouth, a generation can be saved? Can it be that when you take the favor of God on your life and instead of just using it for blessing, you use it to give glory back to God and you partner with the prophetic words over your life and over the region you live in, that God can actually save an entire generation? Last person, Acts chapter nine. You guys hanging in there? Yeah. Acts chapter nine, this is where I wanna finish. Like really finish. Acts chapter nine, verse one. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for the cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way, AKA Christians. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless for they heard the sound of someone's voice but saw no one. Saul picked himself up, up off the ground but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus and he remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. I believe one of the last groups of people that God's highlighting in this season is those who maybe do now or used to hate the church. They used to persecute Christians, couldn't stand when people post Bible scriptures on their Instagram bios. <laughs> They've never stood with the church. They, they, they might not have ever even been in a church or maybe they have church hurt. Uh-oh, that's a big one in our generation. Help me, Lord. <laughs> okay. See, if, there's a, if you're somebody right now in this moment, we're, we, we're, glad, that you're, we're glad that you're here. Please come. We love, we love to have you here. But if you're somebody who, as I'm even preaching or the worship is going on, you're like, I can't stand this stuff. Oh, just wait, because God is going to encounter you himself. And when he encounters you and you see him for who he really is, not who I say he is, 
not just what the pastor says, but when you see him with your eyes, everything will be flipped around. Because let me tell you, not only are we living proof of what God can do, we are living proof that one touch, one encounter, one ounce of the love and the embrace of Father God will shift your life forever. Where you literally go from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Where you go from having your natural eyes open, but you're spiritually blind. Where you go from saying, okay, I see this Jesus, I hear these scriptures, I've heard these songs thousands of times, I get dragged to church, I see it all over social media, I can't stand all this stuff. And then Jesus meets you in your room and flips it all around for you. See, but here's what's interesting. Here's the other side of the coin. Maybe you're somebody who used to be like that and now God saved you. Amen. So glad you're here as well. But you know what's interesting about Paul? Is after that moment of encounter with the Lord, he actually became naturally blind. See, if you're somebody who's new in your faith and it feels like you can't see where you're going, it feels like you're not quite sure what path is the right path, could it be that God is using this season of your life where all you do is focus on him so that you know who he truly is so that you don't build your life on the, on the sinking sand but on the rock of Jesus? Could it be that the Lord is actually placing you in a moment where after an encounter, he's gonna use your life greater than you could ever ask, think, or imagine. But before he does that, he has to make sure the only one that you've seen is him. See, God... I believe in this hour, we're gonna see people raised up who used to be hardcore atheists. <laughs> they used to be hardcore haters of the church. They used to be hardcore haters of pastors. They went to a church for 10 years. Maybe they were a pastor themselves, but they got hurt because somebody said something that they didn't like or somebody took advantage of their trust and they said, you know what? I'm never coming back to God. I'm never coming back to Jesus. But then in one moment, in one instance in their life, when they were on their way to persecute that church and persecute that God, his mercy and grace was so good that he shines a light on them and he says, guess what? I love you. I know you. I want you. You are the apple of my eye, I form you and knit you together in your mother's womb and I want you to know me and me alone. I wouldn't be shocked if we see preachers arise in Gen Z and Gen Alpha where all they see is TikTok witchcraft. Seriously, it's a real thing. TikTok witchcraft. They see Christian influencers who don't wear any clothes. I'm coming for somebody today. And they think they know who Jesus is. Mm -mm until you see him with your own eyes, until you see him with your own eyes, until you see that one who has eyes of fire, hair like wool, he has a robe dipped in blood. He has a tattoo on his thigh that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He has a sword coming out of his mouth. He's riding on a white horse. He's cracking open the heavens. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Until you see that one, friend, you haven't seen anything yet. Until you see him eye to eye, you see Jesus is not just a message, he is a man. A message goes in one ear and leaves the other, but when you see a man face to face, eye to eye, heart to heart, your life is transformed forever. Would you stand with me? Would you stand with me? If I could get the band, that'd be awesome. Please don't talk, please don't talk right now. Thank you, Jesus, yeah. <clears throat> There's two groups of people in here this morning, at least two. First group of people is this. I don't know how you got here this morning. I don't know if you wanna be here this morning, but guess what, you're here. And let me tell you something. This building you're in this morning is the best place to get set free in Newcastle, Washington. Did you hear that? This is the best place to get free this morning, right here, you're in it right now. And maybe, hear me, hear me, Maybe you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. Listen, we are not gonna force you. I'm not gonna push you. No, we're not gonna do that. That's not what God does. God never puts his hand on your back and pushes you. He always puts his hand out in front of you and say, will you come? He is not a manipulative God because that would break his very own nature. So the first group of people is this. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus or maybe like me, maybe like me, you've walked away from him. You're still coming to church. That's awesome. I'm, trust me, I'm so glad you're here. But maybe you've walked away from him. You're kind of doing your own thing, kind of doing the church thing. But this morning, as I'm talking, you're like, man, there's something happening on the inside of me. Let me say it like this. It's not because I'm a good preacher alone. It's because the presence of God's here. It's not just because I have a gift. 
It's not just because I can communicate well. It's because the anointing of God is here and he wants to break darkness off your life. And he wants you to know who he really is. He wants to get that addiction off you. He wants to release you from that depression. He wants to release you from that anxiety. He wants to release you from that suicide. Listen, please, please. I've traveled these last two years and spoken to, I can't even, I don't even know the number. And you see up here, this is what we call an altar. And it looks like there's just some carpet and there's some chairs and there's the stage. Friend, hear me. An altar is a place where the living God meets man. Every person that responds to the altar encounters Jesus. Every person that takes a step of faith, and even if you don't have it figured out, neither did I. Even if you don't have anything going for you, doesn't matter. If you have faith, if you cling to every word I spoke out of this Bible today, if you cling to every worship song you heard, if you cling to that feeling of what God's doing in you, you say, God, I'm gonna take a step forward. I'm gonna believe you're gonna meet me. Guess what? He'll meet you. Don't leave the building the same way you came in. You might be saying, Ross, you just talk like this because you're a preacher and that's what preachers are supposed to do. No, I talk like this because I grew up in a city where there was no hope. I grew up in a family that nobody should ever know my name. I never had any money in the bank account. I never had a father. I never had all these things. But when I gave my life to Jesus, my life was flipped around forever. And the reason why, the reason why I'm passionate is because I know that if you say, God, here am I, meet me, send me, use me, heal me, whatever it is that's in your heart, he won't do it next week. He won't do it next month. He'll do it this morning. Second group of people. As I was talking this morning about the five groups of people here, revival, and you started to feel like a burning on the inside of you where you're like, man, there's more for me. Now listen here, listen here, because I know the setting that I'm in and I'm not gonna tell anybody they can't come to the altar. You can come no matter what. But if you're somebody where you wanna burn, not you're already burning, you want to burn. You want something to happen in your soul where like I said earlier, it's not just a head knowledge, it's not just a hand lifted in a goosebump, but God, I need your presence. I want to forsake everything in my life, in this world, good or bad, and I want to give you everything. I want to burn for you, God. I don't want to just watch the move of God. I don't want to just hear about the move of God. I don't want to just pray about the move of God. I want to be a part of the move of God. I want to ask you in a second to come up to this altar because I want to pray for you. Let me tell you something. The last few days we've been in this conference, the fire of God is here. Friend, the fire of God is not something you should be afraid of. It's something you can't live without. Did you hear that? So here's what we're gonna do. Close your eyes for 20 seconds. Everybody, just close your eyes real quick. I want you right now, not out loud. If you feel led to do it out loud, I'm not gonna stop you. But ask yourself these questions in your heart. God, am I right with you? Jesus, have I surrendered to you? Have I come under your blood and your body? Have I overcame and forsaken sin in my life? P.S., keep your eyes closed while I say this. P.S., Jesus didn't say he wanted believers. He said he wanted followers. Belief is where we start, but it is not where we finish. He said, take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Jesus also said this, he said, if you, have, if you don't publicly acknowledge me on the earth, I won't acknowledge you before my Father. So if you've prayed a prayer to Jesus, that's awesome, but you've never done it publicly, friend, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you, this is, what, this is for you this morning. Just keep your eyes closed. I know I said 20 seconds, a little bit longer. Ask yourself these questions. Jesus, do I need to surrender to you? Or maybe you're in the other camp, you're in the other boat. God, I kind of know you, I'm doing this church thing. I, I love you, Jesus, but like, I want to burn. I want to burn, God. I don't want to just have a Christian confession, but my life looks like the devil. I don't want to say all the right things, pray all the right things, do all the right things. God, I actually want you to know me. I want to know you, God. I want personal, face-to-face, eye-to-eye, heart-to-heart encounter. I want you to consume me, God. I want to be so bored with Instagram. I want to be bored with Netflix, God. I've tried all the things of the world. They don't do anything for me. 
you can open your eyes. Hear me, hear me. There is no pressure. There is no pressure, but if I say I'm a Christian, then I have to share the full truth with you if I say I love you. There's a real eternity. There's a real heaven, there's a real hell. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He didn't create it for you. He created it for the devil and his demons, amen. But God gives every person on the face of the planet a choice. Why? Because if you can't choose somebody, then it's manipulation and you're forced into relationship. So God allows you to choose him because that means you can have true relationship with him. That's called true love. If I came up to a girl and said, you're my girlfriend now, she's gonna hit me in the face and say, you're crazy. But if she chooses me back in return, then we can have a real relationship. Are you with me? So this morning, it's gonna be a little uncomfortable. You're gonna feel a little tension. Your heart might race a little bit. You might have sweaty palms. Amen. You might have tears in your eyes. You might not, you might not feel a thing. That's okay, you just need faith. You're gonna have to, people will see you this morning. I do altar calls with eyes open because for too long in the church, we told people to close their eyes and then they never do anything for God outside the building. So with every eye open, I want you to make a decision if you wanna surrender your life to Jesus and make him your Lord. Get forgiven of sin, get filled with his spirit and spend eternity with him. I'm gonna to count to three. And when I count to three, I want you to get up here as fast as you can. If you gotta push somebody, we'll pray for them later. We have a healing ministry, amen. <laughs> One, two, Three, come on, just come forward. I wanna pray, I wanna pray for you. Come on, come on. Praise God, who else, who else? Come on, come on, awesome, awesome. Who else, yeah, come on, bro, come on. Just come right here, come forward, guys, come forward. I wanna pray for you guys, come on, come on. Who else, who else? Come on, this is awesome, this is awesome, this is awesome. Awesome, awesome. Is there anybody else? Come on, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Powerful. I just want to wait like 20 seconds. I'm not trying to force anybody, but I want to give you an opportunity. Just come forward if you need to. This is awesome. Yeah, powerful. So proud of you guys. Powerful. Way to go. Way to go. Way to go. Wow. Last call. Is there anybody here? You're like, I got to give my life to Jesus. Now you're going to make it awkward for yourself because you waited, but it's okay. Come forward right now. Just come quick. Get out of your seat. I want to especially call in these last 10 seconds, anybody 30 or younger, don't play around with your life right now. Don't wait till you're 30 and you have to go through 10 years of heartbreak. Don't do that to yourself. Get right with God this morning. This is awesome, this is awesome. Is there anybody else? Awesome, awesome, okay. Okay, I'm not trying to be weird, but if you came forward, look at me, okay? I'm not trying to be weird, I promise, I promise. I'm a normal person just like you. The reason why I like to look at you is because you're making the best decision of your entire life. Everything that I said on this mic is not just cute Christian words to make you feel good. The power of God is about to touch you. The spirit of God is about to come in you and your life will never be the same. Are you with me? This right here is gonna be one of the best moments of your entire life. And when you go home, what you're feeling is actually gonna go with you. This isn't just a one type of moment type of thing, it just happens once, this is for the rest of your life. So here's what we're gonna do. The Bible is an incredible book, why? Yes, because God inspired to write it, but because it tells us what to do. I love to know what to do, anybody else? <laughs> he didn't say you have to do some crazy religious ritual where you have to clap your hands 30 times and do 10 pushups, although that would be fun. No, he said that if you would confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, he would save you, he would save me. So I'm gonna lead you through a prayer and I want you to say this out loud, you guys with me? Church, can we join in this prayer with our family, please? So let's just say this, just say, Jesus, I surrender my life and my heart to you. I believe you are the Son of God, died on a cross and shed your blood and rose from the dead for me, Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. I repent and I turn from all my sin. Say this last thing, say, Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, 
fill me now? Say it one more time. Say, Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, fill me now. If you came forward, close your eyes. We want to pray for you. We're not going to do anything weird, I promise. Ministry team, can you just pray for people? While they're praying for everybody up here, second group of people, if you have not came forward yet, and you're saying, God, I want to burn. I want to burn for you. I'm not going to hype this anymore. Just come forward right now. I want to pray for you. If you want to forsake everything else, you want revival to be everything in your life, you want to be bored with the world and consumed with God, I just want you to come forward this morning. We want to pray for you. We want to lay hands on you. Just be bold. Just come out of your seat. Flood to the front. Come on. Come on, lift your hands. Just lift your hands. Just lift your hands. Come on. Come on, you got to cry out this morning. I can't do it for you. Just say, God, I want more of you. Holy Spirit, I want more of you. Jesus, I want more of you this morning. God, mark my heart afresh. Touch me with your presence, Lord. Touch me with your presence, Lord. Oh. I want to see your eyes of fire, God. I want to see your hair like wool, Jesus. I want to burn for all my days, God. I want to burn, God. I want to burn. I want to burn. This morning, you got to close your eyes. You got to focus tonight. Speak to the Lord. Speak to the Lord. Use your voice. Lift your voice this morning. More, Lord. More, Lord. More, 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 more. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Keep your hands lifted. Keep your hands lifted. There's another wave. There's another wave. There's another wave. Fire, 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 glory, glory, glory. Oh, there it is, there it is, there it is. Look at him, look at him, look at him. Oh, let your eyes see him this morning. Jesus, you're beautiful. Yes. Lay aside every sin, every weight that so easily entangles you this morning. By the anointing of God, let every yoke be broken. Every addiction be gone. All depression, all anxiety be gone. Suicide, we curse you. We curse you, suicide. I need more ministry team. I need more ministry team. Come on, come on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. 